Okay, so we'll start from scratch. Uh, yes, Laura, I think we can begin. That's the green tick. Yes. Um, so, so once again, uh, let me invite uh, Professor Laura M. Grisolano for the CADR lecture guest lecture series. This is the eight in the series of the guest lectures we are organizing. The topic for today is uh, the tools offered by parasympathetic nervous system as applied to conflict scenarios. Uh, Ms. Grisolano is an attorney mediator, and one of her key area of expertise is how the brain chemistry uh, interacts with uh, the environment in conflict situations. And I just uh, I would invite uh, Laura to uh, present her views on the matter. Yes. Terrific. Well, thank you so much, Professor Gupta, for the invitation to um, to join the group today. Uh, it's really an honor, and uh, I've appreciated your patience coordinating over this uh, strange 12 and a half hour time difference. Uh, so you'll, it's dark outside, but uh, I understand you're just getting started with your day. So um, I appreciate all who are um, listening. I wish I could see you, see you all. I have thoroughly enjoyed my growing collaboration uh, with the Indian ADR community. It's very impressive, uh, the leadership and the growth of this uh, area of practice, given what a short time uh, it has been to before, um, you know, since it was started. So uh, very um, excited to be here today. And, and honestly, before I get started with the presentation on the neuroscience of conflict, I just wanted to start by saying how sorry I am to hear the details of the recent surge in COVID cases uh, across India, just devastating numbers and um, the whole world is uh, feeling very um, badly about how uh, the struggle has spread just across the country. Um, I was grateful to hear that President Biden uh, authorized sending over some additional supplies and vaccines and vaccine materials. So hopefully that can be a small help. But um, my my thoughts and prayers are with you as you all uh, struggle with this, especially those of you that are kind of personally um, dealing with the consequences of this rotten, uh, rotten virus. Hopefully we will um, finish the year in better shape. Uh, time to talk about conflict because um, we've both seen so many instances where communities are working together and uh, levels of cooperation with drug companies and across governments and across communities and in hospitals. Um, so in some ways it has uh, been good for collaboration and community. On the other hand, um, so many difficult conflicts and contracts that need to be negotiated and new arrangements and everything sort of thrown up into the air um, that needs to be resettled. So an awful lot of conflict um, at the moment, too. So um, hopefully um, the topic is uh, resonant and relevant, um, even as it sort of feels uh, academic in the midst of such difficult um, difficult challenges uh, for your country and, and for the world right now. So let me go ahead and share a, my screen. Uh, hopefully you can see that. Maybe um, somebody will let me know if you can't. I'm going to go ahead and start the slideshow. Uh, yes, uh, uh, yes, uh, Laura, we can see this. Excellent, excellent. Okay, great. Terrific. Okay. So uh, the title today sounds a little bit more like a, uh, a Las Vegas comedy movie, um, a hijacked amygdala, two vagus nerves and a head full of oxytocin. Um, not quite the, uh, the exciting Vegas uh, heist story, but um, some really interesting subjects to talk about in terms of the, the neuroscience of conflict. Just a little bit about where, um, where I'm coming from. I do uh, have a private practice in the United States, Bridge Mediation and Leadership Solutions. 
and I offer sort of a suite of services that help people uh, in conflict, um, straight, discrete mediation uh, sessions, um, then a more ongoing conflict management consulting practice, working with teams to try and kind of help them heal conflict, bring them back together, reorganize leadership development services to help train people in empathy and communications and um, kind of deepen their professional and uh, EQ skills and also executive coaching to help people uh, individually work on um, really whatever they need to in order to, to reach their professional goals. So um, I come to this work um, with some uh, wonderful experiences, even though the path was a little bit winding. Uh, my mom was a neuropsychologist, so I grew up in a family of people that talked a lot about the brain, talked a lot about human behavior. She was an expert in traumatic brain injury so her patients frequently had pieces of their brain that were not functioning normally, which also gives you a lot of insights into how the brain works um, when it's whole and doing well and how each individual piece of the brain uh, is so important. So um, brains and psychology and people were a big part of our a big part of our household. I also was sort of born with a kind of mediator liaison personality. So Across my life, I've ended up in roles that were the liaison to organizations. At my law school, for example, I was the liaison between the faculty and the students. Uh, at my college, the you know the administration and the students. So it's sort of my my natural tendency anyway. Um, I've stayed involved as a trustee of a liberal arts college, uh, which involves a lot of um, difficult and complicated management. I tend to be, again, the mediator in, in those um, sessions as we train young, young leaders. For law school, I had the privilege of going to the University of Chicago. So I studied under uh, young Barack Obama before he was president. Uh, Cass Sunstein, who's an extraordinarily wise uh, behavioral, economist, behavioral economist and others as well. Um, so have we learned a lot about why people do certain things and how we can nudge them into different kinds of behaviors, how we set up systems to encourage outcomes. I worked for a federal judge after law school and practiced as a litigator. So I also saw up close the legal system and how the legal system handles um, uh, case resolution. Oftentimes it's not in a very helpful way. There are there are easier ways to bring the parties together, hence uh, the focus on mediation. Uh, it shortchanges things, it's faster and usually ends up with, um, with better solutions than having to run it all the way through the court system. Um, and then lastly, I've worked for a lot of political candidates, presidential candidates, worked in government, and so I'm a big believer in democracy and in systems that help um, add structure to dispute resolution so that we don't have to resort to um, more violent uh, and unhelpful <laughs> means of resolving conflict. What I don't bring to this topic is a PhD in neuroscience, nor do I bring a master's degree in neuroscience, nor do I bring, frankly, any formal training in neuroscience. So apologies to any uh, doctors or true neuroscience scientists in the crowd because I really am uh, sort of an armchair student um, and piece together what is helpful, but um, I'm sure the subtleties of my uh, neurological expertise, you know, are many. So apologies for that. I wanted to talk today about sort of three key concepts and um, we're short on time and I do wanna make sure that we have plenty of time for questions. So um, I'll zoom through the topics a little bit to make sure that we, we have some time if, if people wanna talk about any of this more deeply. The first is um, just sort of an overview of how uh, we are hardwired both for conflict and for conflict resolution. It's um, uh, the product of our evolutionary history. So we have the systems that we need uh, to protect ourselves, but also to get ourselves out of conflict. And the more we know about those systems, the more we can use them. Uh, the anger cycle in particular is a very specific physiological pattern. And the more we understand it, the more that we can kind of jump in and use shortcuts and strategies, little um, hacking tips to, uh, to shorten the anger cycle, to take people out of conflict um, and anger and into more productive ways of resolving problems. Lastly, I wanna talk about oxytocin, which is a subject I'm really interested in. Uh, I really wish I was a, um, an organic 
a chemist or neuroscientist to, to know as much as possible about this very interesting molecule. But um, it is clear that we can use our knowledge about this um, hormone to help lessen conflict, to increase collaboration. And I, I want to teach you some, some special tricks that have been incredibly um, effective for me as a mediator and as somebody who's worked in conflict resolution. So those are kind of the highlights. And part one, um, this is really the, you know, talking about how, um, how things are really hardwired and, and built into our system. So um, one of the things that we already have as a tool is that we, we are hardwired for empathy. From the minute we're born, we have these tools uh, in place in our bodies. We know we've all experienced that moment when, uh, you know, you see somebody else yawn in a crowd and we yawn too. And um, we are, we mimic um, behaviors for from an evolutionary perspective that will keep us safe. So we yawn if somebody else yawns because it's, it could potentially indicate that we need more oxygen. So um, even that mimicry behavior uh, is, is sort of a somatic empathy. We're also hardwired to not hurt each other. So fascinating studies involving rhesus monkeys. Um, they were asked to, they were put in an experiment where in order to um, be fed, they had to pull a chain and um, they would have access to food, but simultaneously another rhesus monkey would be shocked, a painful shock. And it didn't take very long before the rhesus monkeys figured out that their action in getting the food was hurting their friend or their fellow monkey, and they stopped pulling the chain. Um, they stopped feeding themselves so as to avoid hurting other, uh, other primates. And one um, subject, in fact, even went without food for 12 days, basically went on a hunger strike, saying, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to inflict pain on my partner. And so those empathetic behaviors are wired into our system. We are also um, biologically uh, trained to be compassionate. So this is a situation where uh, this chimpanzee had been in a fight um, and uh, lost. Um, and the, this was a, a female chimpanzee. And the, the child saw that the mother was very upset that she'd lost this fight and went over and put his arms around his mother to console her not something that he had been trained to do, obviously, just that natural reaction of compassion, which is just really stunning. Um, and lastly, especially interesting to those of us in the conflict resolution world, primates also exhibit reconciliation behavior. So um, this is a, another picture taken in the field. Um, these two primates had had a fight and um, then were spotted basically making up this gesture of the outstretched hand saying, hey, I'm sorry, let's, let's get back together. And in the picture that follows, or the moments that followed, they actually met in the middle and embraced, which is just sort of stunning. So we have this built into our bodies already. Um, however, we're also hardwired for conflict. Um, we know that that was, conflict was necessary for survival. So um, we know that animals, when they're threatened, um, adopt one of three strategies. They fight or they fly, or, you know, leave or they freeze. Um, and humans have that same, that same uh, impulse, that instinctive reaction. So, you know, when we were um, in the early days, pre-literate um, and just trying to survive, we also had that built-in reaction that we needed to run away quickly if we were confronted with danger. We still have those physiological reactions built into our bodies. Clearly, we have much more complex thought now. Our conflicts are different than being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, um, but, but those brain structures that helped us survive are still in place. And so we have cycles of response that mimic the same, I mean, that are the same as our our um, prehistoric um, reactions. So uh, even in political conflicts, the, the debate between the vice presidential candidates, you see those same conflict behaviors um, coming into play. So to help us understand this, um, it's useful, I think, to kind of know how these systems and our brains developed. Um, there is a, a theory called the triune brain theory. It was developed by this guy, Paul McLean. 
and um, I think in like the 1960s or 70s, 60, it says uh, 60. Um, and it sort of traces how the three kind of primary structures of the brain developed over time. It's also been pointed out, I mean, there's been a lot of scientific work done since then, and we know now that this is sort of a simplistic explanation of, of how the brain developed. So it's much more sophisticated. There was a, a lot of rewiring. Uh, so, um, you know, caveat that this is a fairly simplistic understanding of, of how the brain's pieces work together, but it's, it's accurate in the you know, these things are true. It's just a little bit more complicated. I think it's super helpful to understand these three pieces because when we get in conflict situations or our clients uh, or our friends or our family members get into um, difficult situations, these you can watch these structures of the brain, brain play out. So the first piece is what we would call the lizard brain or the reptilian brain, or some people call it the R brain. And it's really that basic, um, you know, pre-thought, survival brain so you know aggression um, preservation of territory making sure that you know you, you have the food that you need you're safe you're not eaten by something else and you procreate to continue the species right so that's the lizard brain and they'll fight to the death they'd rather run away really they just want to eat sleep and have children right so that's the the lizard brain all on autopilot right they're not having conscious thoughts like i think i'm gonna go have flies now for dinner, right? They're not thinking in that way. But as animals evolved, we ended up developing um, the midbrain system, um, sometimes known as the limbic system. And this is where, um, you know, more higher order mammals, you can see, have some level of emotion. They feel pleasure. They can plan a little bit. Right? They have memories of things. So a cat will remember if I jump on her lap, you know, she will pet me. Or a horse might remember if I run to that field, I will have, you know, the, the sweetest oats, right? Um, and if I go over there, I might be in danger. So it, it starts to help this limbic system and the midbrain help us start to kind of form memories that match experiences with outcomes and then kind of can guide our behavior more thoughtfully um, to maximize pleasure and minimize minimize risk. And these are some of the key structures um, in this part of the brain that are so um, important. So then we get to what we think of as sort of the human brain, right? The, the one that's responsible for really complex thinking, uh, learning, memory, language, we can read, we can um, communicate with other people thoughtfully, and we're self-conscious, right? We're aware that we are aware, right? We can think about thinking. Um, and so this is the, this is the brain that can uh, plan, that can help law students uh, organize their materials and um, make plans and find the job after school. Um, this is where we reason and, and solve problems. So the most important piece of that is the frontal lobe, which is which governs what we call executive fun functioning. This is really all of the things that law students and law professors, for that matter, need to keep track of uh, to be successful. Um, where am I in this project? Do I need to start the research? How am I going to organize my time to get everything done? Uh, when is it appropriate to ask a question and when is it not appropriate to ask a question? All of this sort of higher order thinking, curiosity and creativity and innovation, all of this happens in this, this frontal lobe. So that's where we're more likely to spend time solving problems and collaborating than fighting, right? Different parts of the brain. Now, when we think about fighting, we need to get back to that mammalian brain, the midbrain, and understand about the amygdala. I wish I could see all of you and I could have you raise your hand about how many people know about the amygdala, amygdalae and um, uh, know how they work. But since I can't see you, I can't pull you, I'm gonna just give you the, the basic scoop. So on each side of our brains, we have these little, they're shaped like an almond, kind of small. And um, they are basically the systems that govern uh, how we take in information from like sensory information about thread and possibility and then process it to decide, is this a dangerous situation or are we good, right? And if the amygdala decides that the situation is risky or dangerous, then it, it basically shifts everything 
triggers a rush of hormones that then prepare you to respond to the crisis, right? So again, I've picked up that there's a saber tooth tiger. I need to run. So my amygdala takes over and it just makes sends all of my energy and resources into survival. This rush of hormones can take about 20 minutes on average to kind of take over your body and change what's going on. Um, and then slowly that rush of hormones starts to go away. So you will all recognize the responses to uh, the result of um, an amygdala hijack. We call it a hijack because it's basically the amygdala says, nope, you're not gonna think anymore. We're gonna put you on autopilot and we're gonna just take care of you. You don't even get to think about anything. We're just gonna give you resources to survive. Um, and I always think about it as, you know, you've ha you have to go up in front of a class and make a presentation or an audience uh, and you feel that fear. It's not a tiger chasing you, but it is a scary moment. Um, and all of these things happen to you. So your heart rate increases because you need more blood flow. Your lungs open up. You start breathing faster and faster because we need the oxygen. And then interestingly, our throat closes so that we, um, we hold in that oxygen and uh, have more access to it as, um, as we need it. All of these things happen as a result of this um, hormonal flow, uh, cortisol, um, adrenaline, all of these things happen. And all of these processes are triggered when we get into a conflict situation. So it might be your neighbor does something that's really infuriating and you're so angry, right? It doesn't have to be a physical risk. It can be something that's just very maddening, right? You're so mad, all of these things happen. Um, your amygdala picks up that it is a, it's a danger. So the good news is that once we understand this system, the anger cycle, we can actually disrupt it and we can sort of stop it from having to take all this time from stop people from saying things that they will regret later, making the conflict worse. Uh, so we use what we know about our body's own reactions to conflict to, uh, to be more effective, especially as mediators or lawyers or even just as partners with our spouses. So a few key strategies to calm down. The first thing, and, and I'll, I'll frame this in, in, many of you will work with clients um, either as mediators or uh, as, as attorneys. And what you wanna do is shift, is try to get them to shift back into frontal lobe thinking, back into that higher order thinking. So you want the blood to sort of return, control agency to return to that thinking part of the brain. So one of the things that you can do is just ask people to think about why they're mad because you can't think about it as a lizard. You have to think about it with your very sophisticated frontal cortex. So uh, once in one subject, um, people were made angry and one group was asked to write, just write something. And then the other group was asked to write about their anger. And the group that wrote, just wrote about their anger, how and why they were so angry, actually calmed down faster because they were using their brain to think about and analyze what was going on with them. And it slowed down that reaction and helped them get back to, uh, back to stasis faster. So, you know, the, the biggest strategy is to just invite other parts of the brain to take over. Curiosity is a wonderful way to do that. Ask yourself whether it's you that's hijacked or your, or your client, ask curious questions. What's going on? What do I wanna do now? What's in the way? What are the opportunities? What, how can we do things, things differently? Anything that sort of forces that, that higher level thinking. One way to do it is to even think about what happens in an amygdala hijack. So you're up on a stage, you're very nervous, your throat closes, your th voice starts to sound very strange and scratchy. If you just sort of say to yourself, okay, this is what's happening. You say it in your head, don't say it to the audience. I'm sweating because my system is overheating and, I'm, and my sweat is my res body's response to being uh, upset and hijacked. I need to cool down. I started overheating because my amygdala detected something that might be threatening to me and make me nervous, That's et cetera, et cetera. And just think about what's happening and that will actually calm you down your blood pressure will return to normal and you'll be able to give your speech without uh, without your throat sounding strange, right? So um, 
all of this is um, works really well, but the key is um, really understanding the parasympathetic nervous system, which is we all have it and it's all working for us all the time. But again, the more we understand what's possible and how it works, the more we can use it intentionally. So very quick overview of, of this uh, system, right, our nervous system. So we have kind of two big pieces of the nervous system. We have uh, the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. And again, apologies, this is like, you know, for some high school uh, biology, but I still have to remind myself of all these pieces. So uh, the brain, the spinal cord makes up the central nervous system. And then the peripheral nervous system is everything that sort of goes out from there, all the nerves that connect uh, to our organs and our systems and our muscles the peripheral nervous system. Then within that um, peripheral system, we have the somatic nervous system, which we can control, like our, our, the muscle or the nerves that help us move our muscles right over here. And that's voluntary, we can control it. And then we have these two pieces that are completely um, autonomous from our thought. They happen regularly in the background on autopilot. We, we rarely even think about the fact that they're going on. But the whole point is to keep our bodies in stasis. So if we get too ramped up, the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in to calm us down. And so one, you know, they, they operate together to keep us in balance. Um, when we are need to run away, right, the sympathetic nervous system operates and it helps us run. But then when we want to calm down, the parasympathetic nervous system are the nerves that connect us um, to the systems that are calming. So the nerves that will calm our heart um, or make sure that our blood flow slows down and the hormones that are amping us up stop going, right? So we wanna tap into this autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system, and use it to help us faster than it might otherwise uh, operate for us. The way that we do that is through this awesome trick, which I'd never heard of until you know a few years ago, um, and it's called the vagus nerve. And we, again, have two of these. They run, they're the, I think the 10th cranial nerve. And they run, they sort of start down the back of our head. And then they, they actually don't even run symmetrically through our body, but they kind of, they wrap around our ears and into our throat and around our tongue. Then they go down and they wrap around our heart um, and then down into our bellies and, and, you know, sort of right next to the diaphragm and in our stomach. The cool thing about this nerve is that it's close to the surface in many places. And so we can actually do things intentionally to trigger this calming nervous system, this vagus nerve. So things that babies do without even thinking about it, like rubbing their ear, right? Or um, laying on their tummy, right? So that their, their nervous system or their chest, that nerve is triggered by the pressure. Um, and then there are, you know, other tricks that we can use that also touch it. So for example, if you put cold water on your face, that will trigger the nerve. If you um, put water inside your mouth and just sort of hold it, it fakes, it fools your body to think that, I, oh, my mouth isn't dry, everything's fine, it's time to calm down, right? So we can, we can use these, um, use these tricks to to tell our quieting nervous system, hey, we need to we need to calm this down here. Let's let's bring it down. There is one really fabulous trick. Um, I'm sure many of you know this. You might not know it by its name or why it works, but we all know that deep breathing is is probably the fastest way to sort of regain control of ourselves. And one of the reasons that we use deep breathing right into your belly is that again, your vagus nerve is is triggered by the fact that your stomach is expanding and pressing against it. So um, uh, if I had you all in the room together with me, I would have you sit back and close your eyes, put your hand on your belly, and then feel what it's like to breathe into the base of your stomach and have your hand move. And do that just for a couple, just even 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, and you will feel your whole body, all that parasympathetic nervous system kicks in and will calm you down. Now, what do you do when you're with a client? You can't sort of explain diaphragmatic breathing, but you can say, 
you know, why don't you just sit and plant your, plant your feet for a second. And before we do anything else, before we go back into that room for the negotiation, or before we do that next stressful thing, let's just take a few minutes and just like get some deep breaths because it'll, it'll help us, right? And, and you can have your client, guide your client or your teenager or your friend through this exercise to, to calm down those stress hormones and bring your body back into to stasis. So another great trick for mediators and lawyers is to do the work of reframing um, a difficult situation and to use words that help calm people down. So I always think of it as like the pot boiling over, right? And everything's just going crazy. And then for some strange reason that I'm sure physicists would explain to me, if you put a spoon on top of that boiling pot, it won't keep boiling over. Well, neutralizing language can work it in that same way. So you basically take something that's been said that's just filled with anger and, and extreme words, and then you rephrase it in a way that calms it down. So you've got a roommate situation and she says, oh, I just can't stand his apartment. It's disgusting. It's covered in trash and dirty dishes. It smells terrible. He's a pig, right? I mean, just extreme language and the anger. And then the person who's the mediator or the coach or the lawyer can say, ah, you know, it sounds like you're very concerned about the way he keeps his apartment. Is that true? Right. And you've basically reframed it using language to sort of take down the temperature of what's going on and start that calming process so that they can regain. This is a question, right? Is that correct? And so you're asking them to think calmly about how, uh, how things are going. So those are some of my kind of key uh, parasympathetic nervous system tricks to calm, uh, to calm high intensity conflict situations. It's 10 o'clock. They can be practiced. Excuse me, that's my computer giving me some timing reminders. Um, but the other, the other piece I really wanted to share with you that I have found incredibly powerful uh, as I've tried to implement it more thoughtfully over the past few years is, um, the role that oxytocin plays in how we think about other people and how we treat other people. Um, I'm sure you are all very familiar with the truth that when you have groups of people that are identified as groups in opposition, things just don't go well. I mean, in the United States, we have some very serious polarized politics right now with the last administration and those that didn't like the last administration uh, we have two different news uh, platforms that rarely agree on even the issues that are important, never mind how they get talked about. And it's a very difficult situation because there's no collaboration around uh, issues that are really important to get resolved. I have come to believe that one of the reasons why it's so challenging to uh, make progress on this issue is because of oxytocin. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about it. And it's still kind of a hot topic for research. We're still learning, um, but there are some things that are very clear that I think are very interesting uh, for people in our line of work. Um, the first is that, um, oops, sorry, wrong button. Okay, the, I have trouble seeing my slides, okay. So the first um, is it's very clear that when we divide people into groups, even when we divide them artificially, like we're going to put you guys over here, and we're going to put you guys over here, and we're going to keep you there as separate groups, it's very clear that we become less empathetic to the people in the other group. So all of those natural behaviors that we talked about that were hardwired, you know, that we see in the primates, it does not hold as we relate to people in other groups, the us versus them experience. We tend to view people in the other group with skepticism. We don't believe what they say. We don't trust them. Uh, we don't care as much about them. We don't feel their pain uh, in the same way. They almost are kind of dehumanized. Uh, and we know that that's true, but we haven't really understood why. So um, it seems that the why has a lot to do with this molecule called oxytocin, which again, uh, not that I know how this process works um, at a deep uh, biological level, but as I understand it, oxytocin is a neurotransmitter, a neuropeptide that is produced in these specialized cells in the hypothalamus, 
once it's produced, it then moves into the pituitary gland and is then distributed into the bloodstream where it does the work similar to other kinds of hormones uh, that um, operate in our body. When it was first discovered, it was actually discovered by somebody who noticed that um, at birth there was a, a, a flood of this um, uh, this substance, oxytocin, that it had something to do with the labor process. And in fact, a, um, a synthetic version of oxytocin is called pitocin, which can be used to trigger labor in women who are, are about to give birth or need to give birth. Um, but we, we sort of came to know it in the, you know, the 60s as the baby bonding hormones. We knew it had a role in birthing a baby and then the bonding between the mother and the baby um, and, and how important that that connection was for the survival of the baby. So it was for a while it was called the mother child hormone or the baby bonding hormone. This is actually my niece and her new little baby. I couldn't help but use, use their picture. <laughs> so sweet, right? At, and th so that's kind of how we thought about it. It's kind of moms and babies. But then we started to discover that it's more than that. It's not just a bonding hormone with babies, but it actually bonds us to other human beings. So um, it's very active in courtships and, and pairing, um, not just in humans, but in animals um, in, in many ways. Um, and uh, is so powerful that, you know, it will, we sort of see it when people are falling in love, falling in love and uh, making, having families, but it continues to operate in ways that keep us paired um, together. Further research also showed that it plays a role in trust. And so um, this guy, Zach, um, Paul Zach, uh, is sort of one of the experts on this topic. And he did some really interesting um, exper experiments. Um, and what he discovered is he would um, sort of in the uh, um, kind of in the nature of those games that economists have subjects play to sort of see what behaviors, negotiating behaviors, um, decision behaviors will emerge. He saw that um, the people that had received in this trust game where you you receive you're partnered with somebody and based on the decisions that you both make, you either get more or less money out of this negotiation. And he saw that when people received a signal of trust, their oxytocin levels went up. So we thought, well, that was really interesting. And then he discovered that if you give people artificial oxytocin by, you know, kind of spraying it in the room, kind of artificially for them to breathe in, they started exhibiting more trust behaviors. And so he became very famous for a while, it was probably still is very famous for um, the trust hormone and how that plays out and um, its potential to kind of, you know, make people more uh, reciprocal and collaborative and engagements. But it turns out it's even more complicated than that. And so his, his view um, was also called into question because it turns out that yes, oxytocin does help us bond and empathize with other people it helps us comply with norms of care we take care of people we we sacrifice to protect vulnerable people we extend trust and cooperation to people in our group we give them the benefit of the doubt we believe what they say but it also plays a role in deciding who we don't trust there are studies that are coming out about how oxytocin plays a role in the way that we look at other people's eyes and the dilation of their pupils and decide if they're somebody that we can trust or not trust. So if you've ever been in a situation where somebody's offering you something and you're kind of looking at them, do they, do they seem like a person I can trust or not trust? Um, you're actually making that intuitive judgment, you know, based on a lot of data points because of oxytocin. So it is actually the, 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 the hormone helps us categorize people based on their trustworthiness and it pushes them into our group and their group for all sorts of reasons that we're still sort of trying to figure out. So once they, we do that, once we've actually put people in another group, oxytocin also um, either elevates or dampens that amygdala activity that makes us feel conflict and angry and fight with people, right? Um, and we do that now based on whether they're one of us or one of them, excuse me, one of us or one of them. So yes, it helps with in-group favoritism and taking care of people, which helps us have a civil society and cooperate and have social structures, but it also dictates from an instinctive, you know, process who we can't trust. 
Now, we know that that is sometimes based on incorrect information. We This actually works even if it's people are artificially sorted. So there's another computer game where um, students are put in front of a computer to play a game and they're given information as to whether the computer is working with them or not working with them, right? It's super artificial and their own behavior and the way that they read and interpret information is completely different based on whether they, they become skeptical of the exact same information once they think that the computer uh, is with them or against them. And if you switch it, they, they will have a completely different interpretation. So this, this idea that um, this hormone prompts non-cooperation is something that we need to be really aware of. And again, the cool piece is that we can use it. We can use this information. So if these are the things that we do to people that we trust and our group, and these are the things we mistrust them, we hoard you know, resources, we're skeptical of them, we can use this information about oxytocin to change that. And in mediations, I've found that it is incredibly powerful to take people that are fighting, people who are not talking to each other, who are super angry, they can't get to a resolution. If you convince them, even artificially, that they're on the same team, they will start listening to each other, they will start believing things, they'll problem solve together and they'll collaborate. It's, it's almost magical and strange. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell a final story in just a second of me where all of this whole, this whole cycle kind of went together. But these are the very specific things that I've discovered is that you can use language that implies a team. So you say we, and we're going to do this together. So as a media, I would say we're, the three of us are going to solve this problem. We're going to come up with some options. Um, as co-parents, right, if I'm working with two parents that are divorced and they're trying to raise their children separately, you know, or because they're divorced now, I can say as co-parents together, and I put them back into the team, and that will soften the way that they think and talk to each other. You can put people on the same side of the table. So instead of people putting people face to face, put them on the same side of the table. So they're all looking up at the whiteboard and we're all brainstorming together, right? We're, we're doing something to solve a problem. We're using our frontal lobe so we're not in conflict or we're not hijacked. We're working together as one team. You can do it too um, with you know other groups. So I work with a company that had two departments that were supposed to be collaborating and they really didn't trust each other. They didn't like each other very much. They had different agendas, different ideas about how things should work, but you put them on the same team. So instead of engineering and customer service, you put them on the same team. Oh, now you're team 2022 innovation. Suddenly they're a team. And now all of a sudden they'll listen to each other and collaborate. And you can use name tags, you can use seating, you can use colors, anything to sort of fool people. And you think about, you know, think about global politics, right? As soon as people have an enemy, suddenly they'll work together, right? We will, the US will come together, you know, to fight with somebody else when in fact, you know, <laughs> currently we're fighting uh, internally. So it's, it's a very strong, um, a strong and powerful effect, but it's pretty easy to manipulate. Um, and lastly, you know, if you focus on a problem to be solved rather than untangling the disagreement itself, rather than on looking at the past, put people on a team to look forward. Uh, and it's, it, it turns out that it's work, you know, it's useful in law and litigation in families with neighbors, you know, public policy, uh, shockingly, um, it works really, really well. <laughs> so I think that is um, the last of it. I, I can tell if we have, I want to answer some questions, but if we have more time, I can tell a, a story of a mediation where sort of all of these things, all of these things played out. But I, I really did want to stop and see if we had any questions. Uh, thank you, Laura, for that uh, wonderful presentation. So uh, what we'll do is first, uh, we'll open uh, questions to this group and if uh, and uh, to the group in the live streaming over YouTube, and if uh, nobody has a question, I can move in the WhatsApp from various students and colleagues. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, anybody in this group that would uh, like to ask a question, uh, please, please uh, raise your hand and uh, go ahead. Okay. 
I don't know if the chat is working, but that that also is fine as a way to raise uh, a question. The chat is working, I think. Uh, okay, so I will uh, go ahead with the questions that I have received over uh, WhatsApp. So um, I have a lot of first. I have a very strange question from one of our students, but I have also received this from one of my colleagues who is a lawyer. Excellent. Uh, he's asking me that, that how do we know if some uh, person is really angry? I mean, can people conceal their anger cues? Because uh, in real life situations, people sometimes do weaponize anger. So uh, if that is the case, of course, nothing would work. I mean, they're just pretending to be angry and using it against mm. people. So is, there, is it possible mm. to know that? Yes, I think it is possible. I mean, you, you, it sort of goes both ways. Some people will pretend to be angry in order to be manipulative when they're not really that angry. And then the opposite is also true where people are very angry, but they feel for whatever reason that they can't express it, right? So you end up with two kind of different sides of the same question. I think if somebody is pretending to be angry, um, it might not be a harmful thing to act as if they, to respond as if they are genuinely angry and use these same techniques. None of these techniques involve uh, just capitulating and giving in to whatever they, they say they want, right? That's a whole other question, a whole other discussion about how do you identify what somebody really wants, if, even if they're saying, I want that person fired or I want, you know, uh, this amount of money right? Um, that may not even be really what they need. So the techniques we talked about today, I don't think that there's any harm in using them if somebody's pretending to be angry. The hard part is when somebody is very, very angry and is not acknowledging that they're angry, then it's a little harder to kind of get them to participate in some of these things that will calm down because it's, you know, they're not sort of cooperating with you. Uh, in being genuine and authentic about what they're doing. But you can still use some of that language, the language work, some of the physical things about um, putting people on the same side. You can, you know, use, um, use tricks like the deep breathing. All of those things can be helpful, even if somebody doesn't want to acknowledge. But then, then there are obviously other strategies that need to be used to get somebody who is angry to talk about it. Hopefully that's okay. helpful. Uh, thank you, Laura. So there's another question from Tejas. He is asking me, uh, Professor, uh, how does law students uh, use this information in real life situations? I think what he is asking me is that law students are not really geared towards understanding the brain and on the physical reactions. We study the doctrines. So how can we actually use them absorb it and use it for our own purposes. Yes. So I will say I went to a law school that didn't talk about this at all. <laughs> the University of Chicago, we did we barely talked about mediation. I mean, we barely talked uh, at the law school about alternative dispute resolution. This I graduated in 98. Uh, it was not a place that thought about um, physiology or neurology or how to reduce conflict, not at all. I will say though, that even as a law student, you can use these techniques for yourself just to practice them. Um, and the more that you practice them in your own life, then when you get into situations where you have more power to structure the environment, then you will know what works and how to handle it um, and how to use it with clients, whether you're mediating or whether you're representing somebody in court. Um, for example, there, you know, it's, let's just say you're two lawyers and you're opposing each other in court. If people get very angry, it can actually, it can actually work against the resolution, even in a court system, right? And so there are things that you can do, even with opposing counsel, to get on the same page and calm that person down so that the hearing or uh, proceeding does not uh, get you know, uh, far afield from what the resolution that needs to happen. I will say though, practicing as a law student in your own life will be very helpful. You can use these techniques with your family. 
So I, I would be shocked if people don't have any family member that ever makes them mad. That would be surprising. Most of us are sometimes mm -hmm. mad at our family members. <laughs> um, and so you can practice Practice the parasympathetic nervous system calming on yourself. Try all of the techniques, try the, and you can have my presentation so you can access it. Or if you want to email me, you can have the, um, I have a list where these are sort of all, all in a list. Uh, try them all. Try the water technique, try the diaphragmatic breathing, try the serotonin uh, leveling that will keep you from getting mad to begin with. Try laying on your stomach try uh, water in your mouth. I mean, just try it all, right? And then see what works. Also try the, the frontal lobe guidance. Try being cured. When you're really, really mad and you're just, you just want to scream, you know, you're just so, so mad. Decide that you're going to be curious. Just for like five minutes, I'm going to stop being mad and I'm going to be curious about what's going on. And I'm going to write down some questions about why I'm mad or why did that person do that or what could we do, you know, why did this happen? And you're gonna use that frontal lobe in your brain. And the more that you do this and train it on yourself, then when you are out there in the world and you have more agency and power, then you can guide other people in, in those same techniques. Uh, okay. So there's this question uh, only uh, from one of my classmates. So his name is Rohit and he's asking me uh, what would help uh, if it would help if we put uh, either beer, wine or caffeine on the table. Will it oh, interesting. Pull the level Very down, pull it up. Very interesting question. So I frequently put out food when I have any meeting, a, a, whether it's um, litigation, mediation, anything where there are people who might be fighting, because we know that, you know, glucose levels and serotonin levels will help keep people out of conflict. Um, we also know that caffeine can increase creativity. So having some coffee, having some tea um, can make people energized and more creative and kind of open up the blood vessels. Um, my guess is that there are also situations where a glass of wine is helpful to sort of, you know, I think it triggers some of those same parasympathetic reactions, right? Um, the calming uh, hormones. Um, and so uh, there might be situations where a glass of wine or a beer might be, a, you know, might be helpful. Those are harder to use or recommend in professional situations because, you know, one glass of wine might be helpful two not so much, right? <laughs> so... Um, I think you have to be careful with those, but definitely um, food is really helpful. You never want your clients um, to be hungry because they will be madder. I mean, there's a lot of research about feeding people before mediation and having snacks if you have a long, a long debate. Uh, okay, and uh, the final question is uh, from Karthik. He's asking me, uh, how do we stop this in-group versus out-group? I think what his question is basically that people are already coming with preconceived notions. So uh, yes. can you just put them, I mean, take it out, out of them? It's very, very hard to unravel the belief that they've already formed about that particular polarized group. It's very hard to take it out of them, um, to convince them otherwise. And we know that just giving them facts, it, it doesn't work because they're, they're suspicious of the facts. What does work though, is, is almost kind of ignoring the subgroups and creating a new group to do something productive. So you have the A group and the B group you can't really convince them, oh, forget about your, you know, say they're, you know, one group wants cricket rules of one thing and another group completely disagrees, right? You're not going to convince them. But if you give them a task, like let's raise money for a new stadium, then together they actually might come together and let go some of that skepticism, some of the mistrust. Um, you saw that in the United States when uh, years ago, Kennedy decided that we would all, you know, 
United States would come together for a space program and we would put a person on the moon, a man on the moon. Uh, and, and people were willing to forget a lot of the past tensions to work together, you know, and support uh, this effort. And so I think it's about inspiring and reforming a new group to help them, at least for a while, stop focusing on, on what they're mad about. It's a very, I think about this all the time. I think about uh, it so constantly, constantly. <laughs> It's a very good that question. seems to be the problem of our times that people have decided that they already have a jersey and uh, very difficult to make them take that off um, yes. so the final question i'm sorry laura but i uh, i mean uh, my, i should acknowledge my colleague professor akansha kumar here so what she's asking is that uh, all this is fine if we are doing in a physical space but if we have a time bound process online how do we do this? Yes. Of another very good question. I have the luxury in most mediations to have the opportunity to work with parties in advance. And so I use pre-mediation conversations to set the stage, to ask them questions that make them curious, to kind of, I sort of set them up to use these techniques much harder in a time bound, um, very short uh, stretch. Um, but I do think that you can make progress. You can use those uniting words. We should do this. To, now, again, it's always a little bit different if you're acting as a mediator, as a conflict resolution person in that short time space, or if you're acting as a litigator advocating for a party. But let's just say a mediator in a very short period of time. And you have, uh, you have two parties. And if you start using those words of we and together, we will all find this an answer. Um, it, you can, it changes things very, very quickly. If you, you know, um, you sort of give them a task to do together. Uh, it, it's shocking how fast that will change the, the dynamic. Is that you with your camera so on? This yeah, thank you so yes, much. Uh, my is... Zoom has been malfunctioning and I keep getting locked off and locked back in. So I'm really sorry about that. Oh, thank no you problem. so much. It's such a great question. And I, uh, it's much harder if you have a short period of time because you don't have the opportunity to develop that trust, you know, especially as are you, were you asking in a mediation context? Yes, I was asking more in a time bound online mediation space that what if, um, uh, I mean, I understand that the mediator's role gets way more enhanced when such reactions are triggered in an online space that is time bound. Breakout yeah. rooms might help, but not when you are completely time bound using a third party uh, forum online. And that's yes. why I asked. Yes. No, it's really hard and you have to be just ready to sort of immediately you know, create that problem solving. If, if you just sort of think about how do I get these two parties, even if they don't agree, solving the same problem. And, and sometimes it's just making a list, brainstorming. If you can just get them for five minutes, we're gonna brainstorm ideas and we're gonna just put up 10 options. And sometimes I'll start it. This might, this is a crazy idea, but let's, you could do this or you could do this. And these are crazy, but is there any other practical thing that we could do? You know, how do we get rid of that? What are the, what are the five ways that we could handle that warehouse property that you're fighting over? You know, I think this is one of the reasons why mediators don't actually like online. Yeah, uh, I, I yeah. don't think it's uh, really uh, the first option. It's just that we cannot do offline and won't be able to do anything much about it till 2022. Yeah. That uh, people are doing this online because uh, mediation is just one dispute resolution method that works best when people are in close proximity to each other. Yes. So that's, I, that's, I, that's a problem we will always have perhaps, right? Okay. Yeah, I think that's right. The best of it. I, I've definitely gotten better over the past year. At first, I just thought, I don't even know how to mediate online. It was so awkward. Uh, but I, you know, I definitely have, have become more comfortable and have, you know, tools, use chat, use the whiteboard, you know, I, breakout rooms, but um, it's, yeah, it's not as good. Cause you can't, you know, mediators often are really good at taking in that information from body language and how are people sitting and 
you know, what do their faces look like when that suggestion is made? We just absorb a lot of information uh, from being with somebody in a room. So yeah, I can't, I can't wait to start mediating in person again, but sometimes people live far away. And even if we weren't in COVID, you know, you have people on opposite sides of the country and you, you know, you have to do it. Um, and one more thing, like just, I just noted it uh, right now, and maybe it's important uh, because you see, when there are technological glitches, it uh, triggers a sense of irritation. And I was wondering if, if, if you are a person already in an agitated state of mind, what that might mm -hmm. do to you. And uh, that might actually ruin the mitigation. For example, yeah. if I'm getting cut off from the Zoom, I'm angry, but I'm not angry at the yes. other side. I'm generally angry. At, yes. at, at the world and it's very yes. difficult to get out of that zone right yes. so uh, so I, I uh, any more questions that you might have you can uh, i think we have like two three minutes um, any further questions you can put out in the zoom or in the google i will put up my my, this is my email address. Uh, feel free to, and my phone number. If you have any questions, you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Very happy to link in with people. Uh, if you have questions or ideas or thoughts, I would be super interested in, you know, collaborating and getting to know you, hearing your questions. Happy to answer things offline as well. So Laura, thank you so much. And uh, we would love to host you at uh, some point of time in the future. I don't know when that time would come, but um, definitely I would love if you could, if in one of your trips, you could uh, join us in our campus. And um, we definitely hope to, uh, from the Center of Alternative Dispute Resolution, we have been definitely uh, hope to keep in touch with you and share our projects with you if that is possible. And thank you so much for your presentation today and taking the time off. It must be very late in the US right now. And uh, so thank you once again. And uh, I shall sign off here. Thank you, Akansha, also for joining Thank us. you for the invitation. Wonderful to see, see you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good luck with your mediations. <laughs>